Yeah, thank you so much for making our time to be with us this morning. Um, we are extremely grateful for your time. Um, and we welcome everyone to our webinar, um, the first fiduciary and Haley and partner webinar, where we'll be talking about um, citizenship and residency migration, the options, what you need to know, and all the things that are involved in with respect to um, securing residence or citizenship outside the shores of Nigeria um, as an individual or with your family. So we really, really, really do um, thank you for your time and hope that um, we'll be able to take as many, uh, have as much information, uh, provide as much information as you would need, as well as um, take your questions. So we have the question and answer um, buttons. Uh, we also have the chat box, so we would um, like it to be as interactive as possible. Uh, we are yet to provide as much information as you would require. Um, as a bit of a background, um, my name is Mercy, um, Mercy Adukugu Amina. I manage um, the firm of First Fiduciary Limited. Uh, we are a focused, we are a specialist focused firm. Um, our coverage is simply to provide um, private client services to high net worth individuals, um, um, affluent individuals, their families, and other personals uh, and other persons that do require our services. Um, our services are with respect to estate planning, whether you want to have your estate plan within the shores of the country or where you have assets located here. If you also want, if you also have assets that are outside of the country in different locations, whether in Europe, in Asia, or, um, or somewhere in the, in the um, Americas, we are also available to provide um, offshore structure planning as well as um, as well as well um, protection. A key focus of our firm is wealth preservation um, and wealth transfer. That's really the core of, uh, of our service. Our, our services range, I mean, they revolve around providing wealth preservation and wealth transfer solutions for our clients. And part of that is why we are having this conversation today. With respect to wealth preservation, um, we've seen a bit of what's going on with, with the Naira. We've had issues with insecurity in the country. And as a result of that, we decided that for our clients that um, are looking at options of preserving their wealth, preserving their assets, um, that are concerned about the security of their families, um, and they just want to ensure that um, they kind of just have peace with respect to the education, their um, um, health facilities and everything that they need, that they require as, as, a, as, um, as a family or as individuals that that is taken care of. And part of that was um, what we've done for clients was to um, work with them to institute um, a citizenship program. and. That was with the team at um, Henley and Partners. So we thought it was that we should also make that available to um, other prospects. And we can also have uh, conversations around what is possible and, and, how, and how that can um, help families and individuals with respect to wealth preservation. Um, quickly to just give us a bow. So we'll be talking to um, a senior personnel with Henley and Partners in the person of Troy Hanley. Um, Troy is a senior client advisor at Henley and Partners London office. He specializes in the Western European and West African markets. As a qualified solicitor, he has a background in immigration and commercial law. Troy has over six years of experience advising high net worth individuals and their families with respect to alternative citizenship or residence planning through cross-border investment. Proud to join Heli and Partners, Troy advised high net worth individuals from the Asia Pacific and North America regarding New Zealand investments and migration schemes. Troy is interested in the geopolitics that surround the investment and migration space and uses his knowledge and experience to provide strategic value to create solutions 
for clients and intermediaries alike. So it's really with great pleasure that um, I want to introduce Troy and also um, let him take the floor. So Troy, over to you. Thank you so much, Mercy. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, it's equally a pleasure to be hosted by First Fiduciary and hosted by Mercy, always a great contact of ours at Henley and Partners. Uh, and yes, just uh, continuing what Mercy said about wealth preservation, that is definitely where our firms work well together. We are both in the business of making sure that families and individuals have the tools to preserve their wealth despite what goes on in the world, despite uh, events throughout the world. So uh, yes, we, we very much enjoy partnering alongside First Fiduciary. I'm just gonna share my screen and run through a presentation with the audience and basically just going through who we are, what exactly the investment migration is and how it benefits clients, but with a particular focus on Nigeria and Nigerian nationals. So Henley and Partners, we are the largest and longest serving investment migration firm in the world. So uh, our, our chairman actually created the concept of investment migration, advised uh, the St. Kitts and Nevis government on passports for investment, um, I would say about 30 years ago. And since then the industry has just grown hugely there's a number of companies in the industry. We, of course, uh, consider ourselves the leaders. They're the largest. Uh, you can see here on this diagram, the different things that make us the leaders, I would say. Firstly, the government advisory. We continue to advise governments on these programs. We stay in touch with governments. We consult them on the programs. Uh, that sets us apart from a lot of our competitors in the industry. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out, obviously, is the track record. There's no other company in our industry that has been running for so long with uh, such great reputation and success. And the reach, uh, that's another thing I'd like to point out. The reach is, is quite impressive. We have over 30 offices around the world, various different countries, different regions. We have basically every program covered. So the programs we're going to speak to uh, speak on today, uh, it's more than likely we have an office in that jurisdiction and that's uh that's quite important for us as we'll see so here you can see our coverage um we have obviously i'm in the london office and there we have a team that works with west african countries obviously nigeria is crucial for that we are expanding into west africa further so we are in the process of having a larger presence there because um the particular circumstances of Nigerian high net worth and, and wealthy people, uh, that it really suits our, our sort of service. And so it's, it's a great region full of promise and a beautiful region, actually, if I can say, I, I enjoy visiting West Africa, indeed. So that's, that's really Henley and Partners. Uh, so moving into the subjects of what we do and how we help people, it's all about citizenship and residence. And these are two concepts that get thrown around a lot, but uh, I'll just go into some key differences with these two, two concepts, if you like. So the first one is probably more well-known citizenship, which is, you know, uh, much of our audience today are Nigerian citizens. They are probably born there. They're passport holders of that country. That's their nationality. And so being a citizen of a country, you have full rights of anyone in that country, including the right to vote, um, the ability to pass that citizenship to your children at birth, uh, international travel on that passport as well, which is uh, a key a key issue these days. Then th this is different from residence, so these can't these shouldn't be confused. Residence is effectively a visa that a country will grant someone. It's not a passport. It's not a citizenship. It's just a visa status that is a step below citizenship. So that's that's important to learn. Uh, however, residence can be extremely beneficial. It carries most of the rights of citizenship. You have the right to live, work, study uh, in this country, travel in and out of this country, um, but you don't carry the passport. You can't travel on that passport. 
Another thing is that in times of, uh, let's say, instability or problems in a country, people with passports can move easier. People with resident visas can be denied entry in certain circumstances. So that's a, a very important difference if you're thinking about geopolitical problems in, in the region, perhaps. So with those two concepts established, we can have we can turn towards the programs. The uh, map here shows the main programs we work with, and uh, you can see that these are it's basically North America and the Caribbean, and then secondly within Europe, and then thirdly within Asia and Pacific. Now we work with these programs because we see that most of our clients that we find around the world are they have aspirations for Canada, US or Europe or perhaps Australasia. Uh, that's not to say people don't migrate to places like, like Africa or um, you know, other places in North and East Asia, uh, but we see the most um, interest in these countries. And these countries here that you can see, they all have a program that allows people, residents or citizenship uh, through investment. And that's the that's the topic that we obviously cover. So I just want to start with residents about why people would pursue residents. It, it may be more obvious to people why you would get a, a passport, but residents um, may need some different explaining, perhaps. So when we talk about residents today, it's it's all about uh, moving country. That's the main thing, and it's about taking yourself or your family and moving for lifestyle, education, security, um, perhaps a different uh, tax regime. And um, it's, it's not so much, it's, this isn't really for the people who would perhaps stay in Nigeria. Um, not usually, it would be for people moving country, as we will see. So when we speak about residence programs, here is a list of some and uh, there's quite a lot listed here, but I'll draw your attention to a few important ones. I think uh, some of the most popular, United States, Canada, uh, and the United Kingdom. We work very closely, of course, with the United Kingdom program ourselves. Those three very important. Um, then there's also some other residence programs which have become increasingly popular recently. Portugal and Greece, they have very favorable investment conditions. I'll show you them shortly, but you can obtain residence in Portugal and Greece without actually moving there. We'll get into that uh, soon. This slide, I know it's, it's very small font, it's very hard to see, but this is a comparison of all of the countries that we work with. Uh, you can see quite easily here, there is quite a vast difference with the residence programs and the investment amounts. That's one thing to notice. So there are some investment programs here, which uh, I think right at the top of the, the scale, there is the UK program. And if you invest for residence there through investment, um, it's, it's as high as two million pounds. So that's, that's one of the higher end. Then you can look at programs in Greece and uh, Portugal, which can be as low as 250,000 euros. And that can be for really quality investments that you actually keep. Of course, it's it generally into real estate and you can get residents of those countries. So the, the entry level is, is quite um, uh, quite doable for, for many wealthy families, I would say. So here, if we can look uh, at a few examples that I'll explain through. So you have the US and Canada. Now these are more expensive programs. You have the US at 900,000 US dollars. You have Canada at 1.2 million Canadian dollars. But these two programs are based on people moving to the country. They really uh, want people to move there. They're not possible for people who are staying living in Nigeria. Um, there are larger investment levels. Um, so if you can meet that investment threshold and you're prepared to move, then they're excellent opportunities. They're, they're excellent countries, of course, for many things, including education and lifestyle. Then on the left-hand side, these two are, I think they're fantastic opportunities, especially if you're someone who's unsure about moving country, 
but you're looking to invest overseas to establish uh, a, a European base effectively. Both Portugal and Greece, as I said, they can be as low as 250,000. Uh, they're both into real estate. So you buy quality real estate uh, without restriction. It can be real estate anywhere in Portugal or Greece. Uh, and you keep that real estate, you can rent it out, you can have it managed by a, uh, a property agent in the country, sending you income to your local account or your Nigerian account. Um, which is a fantastic hedge against perhaps the local currency. You said, Mercy, there's been some problems with the Naira. So that's an excellent strategy there. And then at the end of the investment period, for Portugal it's five and for Greece it's seven, you can become eligible for a passport. So you simply invest from abroad, from Nigeria, and you don't have to go and live there. The after five years, you can find a European passport, Portugal passport, for example, you're visa free to United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK. Um, so it's fantastic investments, I think, um, especially if you have young children. By the time that they're teenagers, if they have a European passport, um, their options are just completely open for them. It's fantastic. So just moving away from residents, because residence is it's usually about people moving. So I have, a, I have an interesting uh, slide here, which shows the movement of, of wealthy families. So uh, this is by no means, you know, something for West Africa or Nigeria. There are wealthy people that are making these moves for various different reasons around the world. You can see some destinations of uh, North America, Australasia, and some places in Europe. Uh, you can see some countries that are losing some high net worth individuals, such as yeah, UK, France, China, India. Very interesting map there. Okay, so shifting from residence, which again was about uh, living in a country generally, you generally move for your family. So citizenship is it's not really linked to residence, as some people will be surprised to find out. Citizenship is often done from your home country. You stay in, for example, Nigeria, you make your investments abroad, you literally uh, receive your passport without any obligation to go and live in another country. And uh, there's some really great reasons to have a second passport. So I think the main thing would be the travel, the visa waivers and mobility. I'm going to dig into that a little bit further soon, but having a passport that has a wide visa-free travel co coverage is uh, extremely valuable these days. Especially with COVID, we have closed borders, we have restrictions on certain nationalities. So having a second passport is, is just becoming so valuable. Um, the next thing I would say is uh, the, the independence and retirement broadly titled there. I think this comes back to uh, having having that uh, that ability to move around the world, uh, retire, study, work elsewhere with com complete freedom. Uh, that's really what our clients are thinking about through these investments. That links into privacy and security, you can see there. You know, a, a lot of clients I speak to, whether they're in Nigeria or let's say Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, they are in the back of their minds, they're, they're thinking about volatility. They're thinking about, you know, issues that arise in certain sectors of the country, certain regions. West Africa is on the whole a great place right now, but, you know, there's potential for future volatility. If that arises, with a second passport, you have an immediate way out. You don't have to flee forever, but it's a way to avoid any conflict in future. So people are thinking about this. I just want to... Um, mention another thing they've got tax planning and expatriation down the bottom right there but this is not about uh, nigerian nationals losing their nigerian nationality or that's definitely not what we we try to do people stay nigerian they keep their passport and i know that uh, you know nigerians are very proud of their nationality so they stay nigerian but uh, as we'll see shortly 
you know, the Nigerian passport sometimes, unfortunately, has some difficulties to travel with that passport, um, to apply for visas to other countries. So that's really what we're trying to, to work around. People stay Nigerian, but they have another tool in their belt for travel. So another uh, interesting part of Henley, we have created a passport index. We were the first people to do this and we rank every passport in the world. It's very interesting. It's very useful to see which passports you might want to have as a second passport. It's very useful to check whether you have visa-free access to a country. You can actually go on this um, on our website. It's an online tool and you can check the Nigerian passport and see where you have visa-free access. You can also have a Nigerian passport and then add on another passport that you'd like to have. And you can see what those two passports would unlock together. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting, I think. Here you can see um, some of the top passports. A lot of them are um, based in East Asia with the wealthy East and North Asian countries and Europe. Um, yeah, a few Australasian countries there as well. So uh, countries, yeah, we, we've juxtaposed uh, countries with weaker passports here against countries that offer citizenship by investment. So this first column, unfortunately, we have Nigeria in there. Um, it shows the, the ranking on the left, the visa-free score on the right. Nigeria currently visa-free to 46 countries. On the right, we have passports that we currently work with. So we can help clients to obtain uh, these passports on the right here. Uh, we'll go closer into these in a moment. But you can see that the visa-free score is, is huge for some of these. I mean, the Austria, Malta, Cyprus, those three European passports, those three, I believe, are yeah, visa-free USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. They also offer visa, they offer you the right to settle in any EU country. It's hugely, hugely valuable. You can settle in France, Germany, Spain, um so the ultimate really in second passports then we have some also really great passports there from the caribbean now these are very popular with west african families thinking ahead for for the investments for their their children or for for business people as well just staying on the index for a moment we have on the left some countries that have improved their score with their passports they're countries that have developed or at the end of their development, let's say. China, who has obviously just developed at an amazing rate over the past few decades. The UAE is in the same place as that. So that's reflected in a strong passport for those countries. On the other side, again, unfortunately, Nigeria is, is on, on that list. So the, the Nigerian passport is continuing to have problems uh, in terms of travel. So let's move to the programs. Um, here we have citizenship programs that we work with. Uh, you can see, again, there's a few in Europe. There's a lot in the Caribbean. They are excellent options, excellent passports. Um, and then a couple in uh, Montenegro and Turkey, which are Europe, but non-EU passports. Um, so you can see here on this slide, we've got a list of countries that they are visa free to. And again, you can see Austria, Malta, the list of countries visa free, it's very strong. But actually, uh, also with Caribbean passports, St. Kitts and Nevis, Antigua, St. Lucia, Grenada, Dominica. If you take a look, you have quite impressive coverage there as well. For, uh, let's say St. Kitts, for example, you have 157 countries visa free. You, that includes obviously the UK, Europe, Russia, Hong Kong, Singapore. These are all major economies around the world. Um, so hugely, hugely valuable for what the investment is. Um, again, very hard to read, I'm sorry, but there's a, a list of the, the programs here for citizenship. Uh, and you can see the spread of investment levels, Austria, at the upper end at about 3 million euros. Malta about just under 1 million euros. But then the other side, you can 
qualify for citizenship in the Caribbean at uh, just 100,000 US dollars. So as I said, these are great passports. The threshold is, is very doable. And I'd like to just touch on three of those Caribbean countries just quickly if we can. These three would be perhaps the three leading in the Caribbean. And they all have a, a similar makeup. And by that, I mean that they have similar visa-free ability. So you can see St. Lucia with 146 countries visa-free, Antigua 151, St. Kitts 157, all strong passports, excellent passports to get. Uh, the same structure, uh, what I mean by that is that for each of these to qualify, you have two investment options. You can make a contribution to the government, which is non-refundable donation effectively, or you can make a real estate investment. For these countries here, the contribution level, about 100,000 um, for St. Lucia and Antigua, 150 for St. Kitts and Nevis, about around that level. Um, then the real estate investment level is a little bit higher. Uh, 300,000 St. Lucia, 200 Antigua, 200 St. Kitts. Now, the if you're thinking about Caribbean, which I, I mean, we, we really recommend for families looking to have quality investments overseas and have a good passport for their family. Um, you've got the two options. Uh, the difference between the two, obviously the contribution is a payment. So um, that's paid to the government effectively for the passport. It's non-refundable. Uh, it's quicker. It's, it makes the process a little bit more simple in that you, you make your payments and then there's, um, there's nothing else really required of you after that process. Real estate, obviously more expensive. However, you keep your investment, you, you must hold that investment for on average five years. And after that five years, it's yours to do what you will with. You can sell this, you can uh, keep it for, for long term, it's completely up to you. So with real estate, there's a bit more administration if you like. I guess you have to keep monitoring your investment and, and stay quite involved with the island. But the other side of real estate is that it can provide returns. So whilst you hold your real estate for your minimum five years or however long you choose, you actually get returns from the investment that you make, rental income effectively. And then at the end, you could sell your share, uh, your real estate ownership at a profit after five years. That's entirely feasible. Uh, so that's some people are attracted to getting investment gains and the passport. You can have both. It's totally fine. So Caribbean passports are definitely something we I always like to talk about with clients, no matter what, because they're they're a really great opportunity. So uh, the final things I'll touch on is the fees and process and how we work, and uh, our our process. We try and keep this very simple. The government applications. They, you know, they have some complexities with forms and documents, but it's, it's our job to make sure it's simple, that you don't have any stress, that it's easy. So uh, let's follow this here. At point number one, we have an onboarding, which is simply some basic due diligence checks to, to make sure, uh, firstly, that we can onboard you. Uh, there's nothing adverse about you as a client before we start. Secondly, we ensure that you would have success in the program. This is important. Um, I'll, I'd like everybody to to um, take note of this. Our firm, if we think that you would have a refusal or a decline in your application, we would tell you very honestly, and we wouldn't take your money. We wouldn't start the process because we don't want to waste your time and your money. If we get refusals as a firm, uh, it's very bad for our reputation. And that's, that's not how we have lasted so long in the industry. There are some companies out there that will take your money very quickly and they will tell you, they'll promise you everything very fast um, because they don't have the same reputation to defend. They will quickly want to get things done. Oh, you've been declined. Oh, sorry, we did our best. That's not how we operate. So um, we, have, we have quite high integrity in that regard. Uh, so after we've established everything's going to be fine, we will have success. Then it's only then we take a retainer fee and we start the process uh, because we are very confident at that stage. Um, 
we start the process to put together the application that generally takes, let's say one month if everybody's moving quickly. After that, there's a second fee and we submit to the government. We submit to, uh, let's say, Malta or St. Kitts and Nevis, the government. Uh, in the case of the Caribbean, the processing time for governments could be anywhere from three to five months, let's say. It depends on the government and it, it varies at different times of the year, actually. The government will deliver a decision. Uh, and it, an important part to note is that after the government makes a decision, it's only then that you make your investment. So in the case of the Caribbean, we spoke about the 100 or 200,000 you only make that investment after the government has given an approval. So you're very safe in the knowledge that if you make your investment, you will get your passport or you will get, get your real estate, of course. Um, there's never an occasion where you'll make your investment and they'll say, oh, sorry, you've been declined. That's not how it works. So uh, your investment is protected all the way through. So... The final thing, uh, discussing fees, um, yeah, it really, it really depends on the uh, variables, the program that you choose, your family size, how you choose to invest. Um, I've given some examples there just as a guideline, but as I said, I think it, it really depends case to case basis. Caribbean, about 30,000 US dollars to manage the entire process. Um, for those European residence programs, we, we explored at the start about 25,000 euros. That's actually for the entire five years, because if you remember Portugal and Greece, they take between five and seven years to get your permanent residence or citizenship. We stay with you the whole time for that 25,000 euros. Documents, yeah, as I said, it's our uh, commitment to make sure this is very simple and you don't have a headache working through all of this. Um, the documents required, it does depend on the program you choose, obviously, the family size, family ages, family makeup, if you have parents um, and so forth, or siblings included, and the investment choice, you know, how you want to invest. You know, if you elect real estate or you choose to give a contribution, that changes how we, um, what, what documents will be needed. Some examples there, you may have seen these sorts of things before for immigration processes, they're pretty standard. You need to show proof of address, medical certificate, police certificate, birth, marriage. Uh, source of funds is an important one because at the end of the day, you're making an investment. The governments of these countries will wanna see how the, the, sort, the funds were, were made initially, uh, whether that was through through business, employment, um, or gift from family, any of these things, we just need to prove uh, where the funds have come from. So that is the end of the presentation about Henley. These are my details here, but you know, moving forward, if there is any inquiries or questions, or if you'd like to have discussions, Mercy and myself uh, would be available to, to assist with any questions you have. Um, let me just change and uh, yeah if anyone has any questions right now I can see there may be some coming in that Mercy's already seen but happy to answer questions yeah thank you okay thank you so much Troy thank you so much um, I, want to, I want to believe that was really really um, explanatory and um, at least you walked us through the basics um, now we understand that um this session is not going to, I mean, it's not the, as in the time we have for this section is not enough for us to cover everything, especially sure. for those who really want much more granular details. Mm. So hopefully we would have other series. Um, we intend, to, I mean, this is going to um, come up again in different series, addressing different aspects um, with respect to wealth preservation and, um, citizen, and using the citizenship by investment vehicle to help individuals and families uh, protect their wealth, preserve their wealth, and also um, take care of other concerns they have with respect to the safety of their families, um, as well as um, other issues that they need to address, whether health or educational uh, opportunities and all that. So thank you so much once again, Troy. Uh, we do have a question here, um, and 
it says um if some goes for I'm, I'm assuming that if a person decides to go ahead with the residency program via investment in for example portugal um he said you can stay in nigeria he can stay in nigeria and have your return on investment are you able to travel in and out of portugal and europe within this time so i'm thinking that the question really says um, is relating to while the process to get the residency or the citizenship within that five year or seven year period what happens are you able to um have in i mean come in and out of that country portugal or other um, european countries within that period Mm -hmm. Yeah, I may not have mentioned that. So that's a good question. So there's three things that are open to you. The first thing is you can stay in Nigeria and, you know, go about your business or, or whatever um, without traveling to Portugal or Greece, as the case may be. Um, that's totally up to you. The second thing you can do, and this is actually um, encouraged, I would say, by Portugal, is that you can go and live there. Uh, you're a resident visa holder. You have the right to live, work, study everything in, in Portugal. So that's that's completely fine and encouraged actually, um, definitely. The third thing it, it, it unlocks is if you're a resident visa holder of Portugal, if you go to uh, live in Portugal with your Portuguese residents, that's an EU residence, you actually have temporary travel ability throughout the EU. You don't have the right, until you get the passport, you can't live anywhere in, in Europe. But uh, within that five years, you're free to travel throughout Spain, Germany, France. It's completely open to you. Okay, and, and this goes to for the family. So um, I'm a family of four, I'm a family of six, um, and I sign up for this program. Um, it means that the, my entire family has this mobility um, available to them as well. Definitely, yes. So all of these programs we've spoken about, they can be extended to the full family uh, in many cases, you can include parents, sometimes siblings, children, of course, always, and your partner. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. Uh, we have another question that says, pretty funny, are your services available in Egypt? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, as you saw, our offices are available, our offices are spread right across the world, and every country falls within a kind of an office delineation. The London office is is basically, um, you know, taking care of the Nigeria, West Africa region. So that's why you're, you're hearing from me today in Egypt. Yeah, I mean, we can we can serve you from London. No problem. That's uh, that's totally fine. We have a Dubai office, which is probably closer. And, you know, I think that they're very active in North Africa, Egypt. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we don't have, I don't see any other questions from the audience, but um, just following up on the, on your presentation. So we want to just make as much, uh, provide as much clarity um, as we can for our audience. So given that there are countries that um, forbid their citizenry to have more than one passport, or be citizens of more than one country. So we have countries like Austria, Netherlands, and Poland. Uh, is there a waiver that comes when um, you wish to when you wish to use um, to go ahead and have those uh, and, and enjoy this program? Uh, will you have to renounce um, one nationality in favor of picking up? Um, another one. So how do you how do you address this scenario? Mm -hmm. That uh, yeah, there are countries that have restrictions like this. It really depends on the country because they have different rules. So, for example, uh, there are countries like China and India, which, strictly speaking, they don't allow their citizens to get second passports. Um, However, you see in practice, people still <laughs> obtain second passports through investment. They still hold the two passports. Um, you know, that's that's kind of their choice and they, they don't show their, their home country. They have that second passport. It's up to them. Another situation is countries like Austria, you just mentioned, they have um, rules against having two passports, but they have an ex exception for if you invest 
in Austria. So if you go and invest there, Austrian government is happy to give you their passport and let you keep your Nigerian passport, for example. Um, and then for the rest of the countries that we work with, I don't think there's any others that have those kind of restrictions. So in general, the investment migration, if you're a Nigerian passport holder, it's absolutely no problem getting another or three, or however many you like. <laughs> okay, that's okay, that's fine. Thank you so much, Troy. Okay, so um, I know you mentioned during the presentation that um, you wouldn't proceed uh, because, I mean, um, Henley and Partners had very high um, standards with respect to processing, um, taking on clients and being able to ensure that the clients actually get the programs that they desire, whether it's the residency or the citizenship programs that, that, that you've signed up for. So it's not a question of collecting clients' money and coming back and say, oh, um, this didn't work or it was because um, something happened in your local in your local jurisdiction that has changed the dynamics with what we are working with and all that. So we do have uh, people that don't really have as much um, um, integrity within this um, um, space. So the question I have here, is it possible? So it's, uh, I mean, so just to reiterate it, um, that there are some countries that have eligibility schemes. Is it possible to have the funds and still not be eligible to apply for a country citizenship by investment? Uh, yes, so yeah, thank you for reiterating it. It's definitely something we like to emphasize. If you have a conversation with us about these programs, you will get full honesty. Um, you will know exactly where you stand and if you're, if you're eligible. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. You can have the money, you can be extremely rich and you can not be eligible for programs. Um, there's a number of reasons why that might be. One of them might be that there is something some publicly available information that may affect your ability to be approved. You know, these governments do, do, do make background checks and they will make sure to see there's nothing major that would mean you wouldn't qualify. Um, so that's one thing. There may be some criminal, something that comes up in your criminal um, certificate, your medical certificate that may stop you, major medical conditions. Um, and finally, I would say the source of funds, the source of how you made your wealth. And if we can show the right documents to prove how you made your money. And um, at the end of the day, it comes down to just having an honest conversation with us. We will assess all of this for you and let you know if there's some risks. If we think, as I said, if we think it's not going to work, we'll tell you very honestly. And we're happy to check these things with you. I think... Um, our team would probably agree with me and say that Nigeria, it's, it's been generally no issues. Um, the majority of the, the clients that are serious have the money and they want to go ahead for, let's say, the Caribbean. We, we don't find any issues at the government level. Um, yeah, I think it's been overwhelmingly successful with Nigeria. Okay, so yeah, thank you so much for that, Troy. Um, another question. So um we, someone wants a greek passport and uh, we've stated that the minimum here is about 250,000 euros uh if the person has much more than that um and the person is willing to invest much more than 250,000 euros would that translate to a shorter wait period to qualify for the citizenship so i mean can we get a one year two years because i really do have all the money um, <laughs> all i just need is for you to speed up the paperwork and let me have the passport. Uh, unfortunately not, no. They, they set these kind of five and seven year periods of residence because they, want, they generally want people to have some connection. They want people to hold those investments for a long period. So they would prefer 250,000 invested for five years instead of a million invested for one, if, you, if that makes sense. That's kind of the attitude of these governments. The only exception would be in the UK. The UK, they have a sped up process towards PR if you invest a huge amount of money. Uh, but we're talking like 10 million pounds. So uh, if people are really rich, there's that pathway. Okay, that's interesting. So a place like Thailand, um, if I decide I want to go to Thailand, 
um, I mean, from the presentation, it looks like that's not possible. It looks like um, we, we cannot obtain the citizen, I mean, become a citizen of Thailand. I don't believe they give out citizenship after living there. The citizenship rules are extremely strict um, in Thailand. They have a residence program. I think it was mentioned in the slides, but it's a temporary residence program. So you make an investment and you have a, effectively a residence visa for about 20, 20 years or so. Um, so it's it's really designed for especially retirees um, and people who are yeah uh, just spending a short amount of time there, not really for workers or, or business people as such. Mm. Okay, so that's more tilted to maybe you're like in your 70s and you just want to have a bit of quiet place to go to so you could have the next 20 years um, residency in Thailand. Okay, that's fine. Exactly, exactly. Another another interesting one is Mauritius, which is a relatively new program we work with, but that's similar. You know, it's for that quiet, more slowed down island lifestyle for close by to Nigeria as well. So that's another interesting point. Okay, thanks for that. Um, we have a question here. I'm a Muslim. I mean, um, I'm of the Islamic faith, and uh, my religion prohibits me from participating in um, activities um, as well as investing in such activities. I mean, um, alcohol, gambling, um, and I, I mean, investing in ammunition and and all the and, and all the like. Um, so really, um, you have those um, prohibitions from having investments within those, within a select group, which is called Haram. Um, so what kind of investments would, um, if, if it wasn't to be a real estate investment, what other type of investments? So that's like a two crunch question. Aside from real estate or making uh, a contribution or a charitable donation to the government um, um, that you're applying to, what other investments um, are, are available? And for someone that is of the Islamic faith that actually has those prohibitions, what are the other investments that could be taken up? Yes. yes. Okay. So I think the good thing is that most of these countries, they have some flexibility with the investments. Uh, I understand that um, in Islam, there is some um, people avoid investments that involve interest or interest being returned to you, I believe, in, in some some sectors of Islam. So in that situation, uh, if it was an investment into, for example, uh, bonds, you know, that's something that we could speak to the client about and actively try and avoid that for them, no problem. Uh, and you could target things perhaps like real estate or you could um, uh, in some in some programs throughout the world uh, invest in business that specifically doesn't operate in these areas and one I'm thinking of is New Zealand New Zealand has a very very broad um, investment regime you can choose to invest in, in any kind of business effectively and it's up to you exactly uh, what that would be uh, the same is for the UK they have business categories they have an investor program it's generally into into business types and it's it's up to the client to have control over that it's never you know you're never forced to invest into anything yeah thank you just just to mention um i think we were kind of working on structuring um, um one of such transactions and uh, the best we could come up with is um making it as a philanthropic donation but um but streamlining it to a select um, um, cost, like a select um, um, segment for community development. So, so thank oh. you so much for making that um, um, clarification. Um, another question here is, um, can there be co-ownership of the investment? So for example, can I partner with my younger brother, my elder sister, uh, to invest a little above the minimum capital and be able to secure um, citizenship for both of us. Now we are sisters. Um, um, we are not, uh, yeah, brother, sisters, or maybe like uh, a cousin or my bestie, my best friend. Okay. And I partner with her. Um, we both contribute this money together. And do we do we get to? Can we own? Can we um, enjoy enjoy um, any of the programs? In that um, with that structure 
Uh, so two things, obviously, if it's your real sister and we can show there's some dependence on uh, each other, then yeah, you can qualify as a family member in most circumstances. Uh, if it's if it's a friend, a cousin, a, a sister, friend, uh, in that situation, um, what you could do is both invest the minimum into one one asset. Let's take the example of Greece. You could both invest two hundred and fifty thousand into a five hundred thousand euro house. Then you could both qualify. But uh, if you're not seen to both be doing the minimum, then um, unfortunately you won't be able to qualify. That expects each person to make the investment. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that means that if it's not um, if if it's not a blood relative or there is a dependency um, arrangement there, or you could see it, that means that um, my bestie and I cannot cannot come together and contribute that money. We have. So both of us have to go get um, that value difference. That's it. That's it. Yeah, we. It's it's common if you have, let's say, a few families who are all cousins. Let's say um, they all invest into one asset. They all make the minimum investment each. Um, we, we see that from time to time. That can be quite effective for managing the one asset. Okay, that's fine. Um, so how many family members? Is there a restriction? What if I have six? What if I have 12? That's, that's totally fine as long as they're your family members. It could be a hundred. No, no cap. Well, okay. Interesting. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's good. So I know you, and, um, you talked about resale. Um, as in the resale to a citizenship. Uh, I mean, the resale to a citizenship by uh, investment applicants. What does that mean? What does the resale mean? Uh, so resale in the context of, let's say, the Caribbean or actually any of these programs that have real estate, at the end of the minimum holding period, you can sell the real estate if you like. You no longer have to hold it. You can, it's, it's basically on the open market. You can sell to another person in, in Portugal, Greece, St. Kitts or Granada, wherever. Uh, or you can sell to someone, usually in most cases, uh, in most of these programs, you can sell to someone else doing the program. There's no restrictions on that. There may be some restrictions with the Caribbean islands. So, you know, we would check that first. But in the case of, yeah, Portugal and Greece, it's just on the open market. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Troy. So uh, we have two other areas that we want you to provide uh, some information on, and that's on Brexit. Um, the implication Brexit has with, with respect to, especially within the European uh, uh, um, space. Um, we know that Brexit is really um, for, from the from from Britain itself. But what has it? I mean, as there, I mean, what what has been the effect of Brexit generally? Then two is um, on tax. Now we know that um, whether you're a citizen, I mean, whether you're coming in. Mostly, if you're coming in for the citizenship by investment, I mean, you're you, you're not coming for the residence, but um, but even as but even if you're coming in, whether as a resident or as a citizen, there are tax implications. You understand because you use the, the infrastructure that's provided for you by the government by that society, and uh, it's not free. Those infrastructures are maintained and all that. So, um, how does the tax work so that I don't leave a very um, negligible minor tax space and I come to a very um to to and I come to, and I um migrate to a country where my tax um obligations are just they're just eating in, into everything that um that that I earn and um and all my returns so how does tax work and um mm -hmm. let's also have the effect of Brexit as well. Yeah uh so brexit is it's finally being implemented this year i would say the main thing that we see is obviously between the uk and europe there's now no longer a, a, an open border uh, for uh, eu citizens moving into the uk and uk citizens going back so in that regard um you now have to uh, you now have, have visa on arrival let's say if you're a european coming to the uk you have a visa on arrival as a visitor and then you have to apply for other visas. So it's no longer automatic settlement rights. 
and vice versa for UK nationals. So the effect of that is you're seeing, uh, we're starting to see a lot of UK nationals look very closely at these programs like Portugal and Greece, because now they want to have access to the EU block. They want to have that freedom of movement there. Uh, and I expect that now we will have EU nationals who once enjoyed going to London, spending time there, sending their kids to school there. They are going to look at UK immigration programs. That's the main thing. Besides that, I mean, um, yeah, in, in general, I think the UK is uh, in place to perform pretty well. I, I hope and I imagine, I think that now that they can set their own sort of um, regulations and taxes, perhaps they could do really well from here. That's just my, my opinion. Uh, so with the tax side of things, obviously Henley, we don't directly do tax work, so I'm not a tax advisor myself. Um, but when clients go through these processes, especially if they're moving, Mercy, you said it exactly correct. If a client is moving country, uh, generally speaking, their tax residency is likely to shift. Um, there are other factors involved and tax advisors can advise on this. Um, but we make sure our clients are well informed about the, the tax situation and we work with professionals in each of these countries. So the example of Portugal, someone asked earlier, you know, can I go and live in Portugal? That's, that's great. We encourage that actually. That's brilliant. You can buy a house there. You can get residence through this house investment. If you're spending most of your time there, there's likely tax implications. So we would introduce a, a tax expert who is uh, local in Portugal. They would help actually before you make your investment and move that advise on all tax matters that you would need to know about. So we, we usually have that, that covered. Um, and some of these countries, uh, and especially in Europe, they have surprisingly friendly tax regimes. So if you think about Portugal has specifically a, a regime for people who are, are new to the country, arriving in the country, which is very beneficial. Greece is bringing in a number of different um, uh, benefits for um, especially retirees or new wealthy people coming to settle. So some great opportunities out there for tax. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, just for us, um, just to uh, provide a bit of more um, information, for us at First Fiduciary, we, we have our affiliates um, tax, tax aid and um, we really do look at the tax implications. Um, so where we do have clients that want to have uh, international exposures, whether uh, for their uh, global businesses or other considerations that they want to um, have when it comes to tax, we could also give them um, our own um, opinion as regards those tax, um, those tax implications offshore. But basically we also uh, work because we, we also have uh, domestic partners as well. So we also work with, um, with uh, residents, domestic, uh, domestic partners within those um, jurisdictions to also be able to, to provide a tax uh, uh, opinion. And it's very, very essential that um, those, I mean, a tax information is very important. You can't have this and um, end of the day, you, are, you I mean, you kind of start asking yourself, what am I, um, what am I living for? What am I doing here with respect to the commitments I need to make? So very, very instructive. And it's also good to learn that um, even the jurisdictions we are talking about today, Portugal, they do have those um, considerations and you don't have uh, extremely very high um, um, tax obligations to meet. Uh, we have other questions here. Um, for Mata, Troy, what are the options? Um, donation to government or real estate investment? Yes, the most popular or most well-known program in Malta is a citizenship program that is based around contribution to the government uh, and real estate. Effectively, those two main elements, your investment for a family is just slightly less than 1 million euros. But um, after about roughly a year, you'll get a Maltese passport, which is extremely strong. You have the right to settle throughout the EU visa-free to the United States, the States, which is extremely rare, uh, Canada visa-free, all of these countries. So it's a fantastic program. 
There is a, a residence program in Malta as well, which of course is not the passport. It's it's the residence that can lead to citizenship essentially, which is a, a mix of uh, different investments to be made, including real estate. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if a client has the financial ability to do Malta, it's it's a fantastic opportunity. Okay, um, we have, yeah, so there is, yeah, is there an age limit to the kids that can be covered by their parents' investment contribution or donation? So, um, is, is there an age limit? Hmm. Okay. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. For the, um, for the Caribbean programs, uh, it's very, it's very lenient. So it can be sometimes up as high as, uh, 30 years old, but we, we would need to show that there's dependency. We, usually we need to show that the kids are studying, they're financially supported by mum and dad. If they're, if they're out working and they have kids of their own and so forth, it's, it's not going to work. But uh, I, yeah, in terms of age limit, you know, it's up to 31, I think, for the Caribbean. Okay, that's fine. So, but, but I mean, but 30 is pretty much significant. Yeah. I mean, given yeah. that we are in the generation, uh, I mean, we are in the um, generation Z, I mean, you have us, uh, yeah. So, really, by 30, 30, 31 yeah. seems mm -hmm. fair. Yeah. So, um, sure. as long as you can show that, that there is a um, dependency there. Okay, that's fine. How much would it cost in total for a person to get an English passport? Uh, that of course depends on the category there are a number of categories important to remember the uk doesn't have a citizenship program it'll only have residence programs which lead to citizenship but um the most common would be the investor category which two million pounds for the investment process there are actually business categories which are far less uh, there's business categories which can be investments of as low as fifty thousand pounds uh, they are difficult categories. You have to be quite an established business person, but uh, it can be as low as 50,000. So if someone is a, a, a businessman with a good track record in business, they have that amount of money to invest and they wish to come to the UK, yeah, let's let's talk about it. It's definitely a chance. Okay, that's good. Another thing, um, so with these programs, you need to have an outlay. You need to have... Um, some money is um, set aside. Um, we have a question here that um, some some individuals would, for example, want to work five to six years um, in the UK to be eligible for citizenship. So why should they? Why I mean, why should I think about having that? Um, having to put down that amount of money when I could maybe go for the other option of just um, getting a work permit if that is available and now use that to become a citizen. Yes. Okay. So if you're prepared to move to another country, um, then of course that is a pathway open to you. If you're willing to work in, and stay in that job for five, six, seven years for the passport, that's a pathway. Um, obviously it's a big if because it's not always easy to get a job from when you're overseas to have a job offer to then go through the work visa process and have an approval and then migrate across i mean there's a lot of ifs involved with that um, for families who are able they can make the investment and there's none of this if you know they make their investment it's passive it's into real estate for example in some of these countries they don't have to stay in that one job for five or six years they have complete freedom um, that's the difference. Uh, it's a lot easier. It's a lot less stressful. Um, that's that's really what investment migration is. It's avoiding all of that hassle of, of the job, the, um, the yeah, the job process, the work visa process, work visa renewals. It's going straight towards permanent statuses just through investment. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for that, Troy. Um, so we have another question that says, if you have investment in one of the country before now, and you really didn't think about you just maybe just happened to have that investment and an opportunity came in and you were pursuing citizenship for that country that you have that investment can you now go ahead and using that investment as a basis now apply for citizenship in most cases yes yeah 
uh, it depends on the program, it depends on the investment. But uh, yeah, let's take the good examples of Portugal and or Greece. If you already have real estate there or some kind of investment there, there's a chance that you could use that to qualify for the program. So we just we would just need to check what that is and, and see if it would qualify, that's all. Okay. Um, then does the citizenship end with winding up of an investment in any of these countries? It doesn't end really, but we have, have that as one of our questions that, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. end, I, isn't it? Well, usually there's a, a minimum period you hold the investment. Um, if you sell within that minimum period, then you're going to compromise your... So in the Caribbean, they can actually invalidate your passport if you sell your real estate within the five years or so. So that's not advisable. But after that five years, yeah, you can sell. You can completely wash your hands kind of of, of the country if that's what you choose. And you, your passport stays, yeah. Okay. So will an applicant have to pay separately for the tax advice? From the tax advisor. Uh, so, in most cases, the we will provide a, a tax session, uh, uh, kind of like a tax planning session, which is at no extra cost. Then, if it's ongoing, you know, if you move to this country, you want to have ongoing advice. That's separate to our service, yeah, because that's. I mean, we can't indefinitely cover people's tax advice, so that would be separate. Okay, so does LA and Partner help with Canadian visa process? Uh, we work with the investor program. And when it comes to, you know, if, the, if it's perhaps with the business categories, we can introduce you to the right people. But generally, if it's to do with work, uh, we're, we're not really working in that space, unfortunately. Okay, thank you so much, Troy. So we're going to open the um floor to have our audience ask their questions so uh we don't know if we have anyone in the audience that um wants to signify by raise of hand um and we'll make the mic available so you could um ask your questions so do we have anyone that wants to directly ask a question um, we are not seeing any hands raised, so um, I think we've taken most of the questions um, that were shared in the chat box as well as um, in the question and answer um, box as well. So we want to thank everyone, um, um, especially Troy, thank you so much. Um, so like I said, this is in a series, so um, definitely we are going to be calling up on you. <laughs> Um, yeah, to, uh, yes, exactly. So we'll be calling up on you and we do hope that um, sufficiently to a large extent, we've been able to um, provide as much information and clarity on how um, individuals, um, wealthy individuals, um, wealthy families can take um, advantage of um, preserving their wealth by having um, investment migration um, available for them. Um, yeah, so I think we've taken, I see some comments coming in, but I think, uh, I, know, I don't think they are, they are no questions. Okay, so there are no questions. So we want to thank our participants. We really want to thank those that took our time to come um, be with us and get as much information as possible. We do look forward to further engagement and our services are readily available. Um, our website is up. You can chat with us. You can um, send us an email. Um, you can ask for further clarifications. We are available. We have a team of advisors around who are um, um, trust and estate specialists. And um, yeah, so we, we, we do look forward to working with, with anyone and providing as much information and, and clarity. Try to be available as well. So um, kindly do reach out and um, We'll be happy to have a conversation and walk you through any of the process that you do require. Thank you so much, Troy, once Definitely. again. And thank you so You're much welcome. to everyone who has um, who has um, logged in and uh, and listened to us. The recordings will be available. Um, this time. Please do kindly um, look out for the emails. Thank you so much, everyone. And do have a beautiful afternoon. <laughs>